Here are nursing practice questions from 41 to 50. If you didn't subscribe to our channel please consider it. The nurse is educating a client with myasthenia gravis about avoiding acute symptom exacerbation, myasthenic crisis. Which of the following client statements indicate a correct understanding of the teaching? Select all that apply. 1. I should eat semi-solid foods instead of solid foods. 2. I should still receive a flu vaccine annually. 3. I should use a bladder training schedule to prevent incontinence. 4. Will plan to get my errands done in the evening. 5. I will take my medication before meals. Correct answer. Myasthenia gravis, MG, is an autoimmune neuromuscular disease that involves the attack of acetylcholine receptors by autoantibodies at the neuromuscular junction. The deficit acetylcholine receptors cause fluctuating skeletal muscle weakness and fatigue. Myasthenic crisis is an exacerbation of MG due to disease progression, deficiency in anticholinesterase. Illness or stress. Interventions to manage MG and prevent myasthenic crisis at home include Eating semi-solid, easily chewed, foods instead of solids or liquids to conserve energy and prevent choking, aspiration. Option 1. Receiving an annual flu vaccine to prevent infection and undue stress. On the respiratory system and muscles. Option 2. Taking acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, like pyridostigmine. Neostigmine, before meals so that peak effects of the medication help the client to eat and swallow food. Option 5. Option 3. MG affects the skeletal muscles. Which do not impact a client's ability to void. Bowel and bladder function would be affected by dysfunction of the reflexes or the CNS, like, multiple sclerosis. Option 4. For clients with MG. Skeletal muscles tend to be stronger in the morning and weaken throughout the day. Clients should plan most of their daily activities in the morning when strength and energy are highest. Educational Objective Myasthenia gravis causes decreased numbers of acetylcholine receptors in skeletal muscles, which causes skeletal muscle weakness and fatigue. Interventions to manage myasthenia gravis and prevent myasthenia crisis include consuming semi-solid foods, receiving annual flu vaccines, and taking anticholinesterase medications before meals. A client with ulcerative colitis is prescribed the drug sulfasalazine. Which information should the nurse discuss with the client concerning this drug? Select all that apply. 1. Drinking 8 glasses of water daily. 2. Stopping the medicine if blood is present in stool. 3. Stopping the medicine if urine turns an orange-yellow color. 4. Taking folic acid supplements. 5. Wearing sunscreen when outdoors. Correct answer. Sulfasalazine, azulfidine, is a sulfonamide, salicylate and sulfa antibiotic and non-biologic disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug, DMARD, used for mild to moderate chronic inflammatory rheumatoid, arthritis, raw, and inflammatory bowel disease, like ulcerative colitis. It inhibits the production of prostaglandin, a mediator in the body's inflammatory response. Most sulfa medications, like trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, share common side effects, including Crystalluria causing kidney injury. Clients should drink 8 glasses of water daily to maintain adequate urine output, 1,200 to 1,500 milliliters per day. Photosensitivity and risk for sunburn. Clients should avoid sun. Exposure and apply sunscreen. Folic acid deficiency. Megaloblastic anemia and stomatitis. Clients should eat folate-rich foods and take 1 mg per day folic acid supplement. Rarely life-threatening agranulocytosis, leukopenia, clients should be monitored for complete blood count at the start of therapy and report fever or sore throat immediately. Stevens-Johnson syndrome, clients should stop the medicine if rash develops. Option 2, ulcerative colitis is characterized by bloody diarrhea, and the medication is taken to reduce this effect. Option 3, 
Urine and skin can turn an orange-yellow color but will return to normal when the drug is discontinued. This is an expected finding. Educational Objective Sulfasalazine, azulfidine, is used for mild to moderate chronic inflammatory raw and inflammatory bowel disease. Important adverse effects include crystalluria with kidney injury, yellow-orange skin and urine discoloration, folic acid deficiency, and photosensitivity. The nurse is performing a postpartum assessment 12 hours after the prolonged vaginal delivery of a term infant. Which assessment findings should be reported to the healthcare provider? 1. Complaints of discomfort during fundal palpation. 2. Foul-smelling lochia. 3. Oral temperature 100.1 F, 37.8 C. 4. White blood cell, WBC. Count 24.000 M3. Correct answer. A foul odor of lochia suggests endometrial infection. This client has an increased risk of infection due to her prolonged labor, which involved multiple cervical examinations. The odor of lochia is usually described as fleshy or musty. A foul smell warrants further evaluation. Other signs of endometrial infection are maternal fever, tachycardia, and uterine pain, tenderness. Option 1. Palpation of the postpartum uterine fundus is commonly uncomfortable for the client. If the client complains of increasing pain, further evaluation is needed. Option 3. Major signs and symptoms of endometrial infection include temperature above 100.4 F, 38.0 C, chills, malaise, excessive uterine tenderness, and purulent, foul-smelling lochia. During the first 24 hours postpartum, the temperature is normally elevated. Temperature above 100.4 F, 38 C, requires further evaluation. Option 4. The WBC count is normally elevated during the first 24 hours postpartum up to 30,000 per millimeter. Leukocyte levels that are not decreasing require further evaluation. Educational Objective. Signs of endometrial infection include elevated temperature, chills, malaise, excessive pain, and foul-smelling lochia. During the first 24 hours postpartum, temperature and WBC count are normally elevated. Fever and leukocyte counts that do not decrease require further evaluation. The nurse is caring for a client in the first trimester during an initial prenatal clinic visit. Based on the information provided by the client, which factor places the client at an increased risk for preterm labor? 1. Age 25. 2. Periodontal disease. 3. Vegetarian diet. 4. White ethnicity. Correct answer. Preterm birth is defined as birth before 37 weeks and zero days gestation. Infection, like periodontal disease, urinary tract infection, is strongly associated with preterm labor. Particularly when untreated, option 2. Infection causes release of inflammatory mediators such as prostaglandins, which are uterotonic, promote contractions, and contribute to cervical softening. Some risk factors for preterm birth may be modifiable with lifestyle changes and early treatment. Risk factors should be addressed at the initial and each subsequent prenatal visit to allow for early identification and management. Some risk factors for preterm birth include History of spontaneous preterm birth in a previous pregnancy Single largest independent risk factor Previous cervical surgery, such as a cone biopsy, weakens cervical support Tobacco and or illicit drug use. Option 1. Maternal ages less than 17 and greater than 35 are associated with increased risk for preterm birth. Maternal age of 25 is not a risk factor. Option 3. Maternal undernutrition can increase the risk for preterm birth and low infant birth weight. However, a balanced vegetarian diet with adequate pregnancy weight gain does not increase preterm birth risk.
Option 4, non-Hispanic black women have the highest rates of preterm labor and birth. Non-Hispanic white ethnicity is not a risk factor for preterm birth. Educational objective, infection, like periodontal disease. Urinary tract infection, places pregnant clients at increased risk for preterm labor and birth. Other risk factors include history of preterm birth, previous cervical surgery, tobacco, illicit drug use, and maternal age less than 17 or greater than 35. The nurse is administering a pink pill to a hospitalized medical surgical client. The alert, oriented client says, This is a pill I haven't seen before. What follow-up action should the nurse take next? 1. Check the healthcare provider's prescription in the medical record. 2. Explain that the healthcare provider has prescribed the medication. 3. Look up the medication in the pharmacology reference. 4. Teach the client about the purpose of the medication. Correct answer. When a mentally competent client questions a drug administration, the safest option is to first check the prescription to verify the six rights of medication administration, option one. If an error is ruled out, like different brand, new order, the nurse should follow up with appropriate teaching. Option two, the nurse must first verify all aspects of proper medication administration. If they are correct, the nurse should provide appropriate teaching on why the healthcare provider prescribed the medication. Explaining that the nurse is just following orders is rarely the correct answer. Option 3. A pharmacology reference can verify information about the medication but will not confirm that the client is the correct recipient. Acceptable identifiers include first and last name, medical record number, and birth date. Option 4. The nurse can teach the client about the purpose of the medication after the six rights have been verified. Educational objective. When a competent client questions a new medication, the nurse should first verify the six rights of safe medication administration. Right client, medication, dose, route, time, and documentation. If safe administration has been confirmed, the nurse should then provide appropriate teaching to the client. A client is receiving a continuous heparin infusion and the most recent APTT is 140 seconds. The nurse notices blood oozing at the surgical incision and eye insertion sites. What interventions should the nurse implement? Select all that apply. 1. Continue heparin infusion and recheck APTT in 6 hours. 2. Prepare to administer vitamin K3. Redraw blood for laboratory tests. 4. Review guidelines for administration of protamine. 5. Stop infusion of heparin and notify the healthcare provider, HCP. Correct answer. Depending on the institution and HCP, a therapeutic APTT level for a client being heparinized is somewhere between 46 to 70 seconds. 1.5 to 2.0 times the baseline value. An APTT of 140 seconds is too long and this client is showing signs of bleeding. The nurse should stop the heparin infusion, notify the HCP, and review administration guidelines for possible administration of protamine, reversal agent for heparin. Option 1. Continuing the heparin infusion will put the client at risk for a severe bleeding episode. Option 2, vitamin K is the reversal agent for warfarin. Option 3, there is no reason to redraw blood for laboratory workup at this time as the abnormal APTT result is consistent with the client's bleeding. Laboratory studies may need to be redone within one hour of stopping the infusion or giving a reversal agent. Educational objective. The nurse should stop the infusion of heparin when there is evidence of bleeding. The HCP should be notified immediately and the nurse should be prepared to give protamine if ordered. A 7-year-old client receives a scalp laceration to the back of the head while on a playground, and the new nurse prepares to irrigate the wound. 
Which actions by the new nurse would require the experienced nurse to intervene? Select all that apply. 1. Administers the prescribed analgesic 30 minutes before irrigating the wound. 2. Cleanses the wound from the most to the least contaminated area. 3. Obtains a 10 ml syringe and a 27 gauge needle. 4. Reviews the child's most recent immunization record. 5. Uses continuous pressure to irrigate and repeats until drainage is clear. Correct answer. Before an open wound is closed, irrigation is performed to wash out debris and bacteria to ensure appropriate wound healing. This is important for wounds obtained in an outdoor environment, like playground, as contamination with soil or dirt greatly increases the risk of infection. To perform wound irrigation, administer the analgesic 30 to 60 minutes before the procedure to allow medication to reach therapeutic effect. Option 1. Don a gown and mask with face shield to protect from splashing fluid and sterile. Gloves to maintain surgical asepsis and prevent infection. Fill a 30 to 60 ml sterile irrigation syringe with the prescribed irrigation solution. Attach an 18 or 19 gauge needle or angio catheter to the syringe and hold one in 2.5 cm above the area. Use continuous pressure to flush the wound, repeating until drainage is clear. Option 5. Dry the surrounding wound area to prevent skin breakdown and irritation. Immunization history is reviewed to determine tetanus vaccination status. Option 4. Typically, a tetanus vaccination is administered if the client has not had one within the last 5 to 10 years. Depending on the contamination level of the wound, Option 2. Wounds should be cleaned from the least to the most contaminated area to prevent recontamination. Option 3. A 10 ml syringe would require frequent refilling. A larger syringe is more appropriate. The narrow lumen of a 27 gauge needle would provide excessive irrigation pressure. Educational objective. Open wounds must be free of dirt and bacteria prior to closure to reduce the risk of infection. Wound irrigation requires surgical asepsis. The nurse is performing post-delivery care of a newborn delivered at 35 weeks gestation. Which of the following actions by the nurse are appropriate? Select all that apply. 1. Covers the scale with warmed blankets before weighing the newborn. 2. Encourages skin-to-skin -skin contact between the stable newborn and mother. 3. Performs diaper changes underneath a radiant warmer. 4. Places the identification band on the newborn before beginning to dry off amniotic fluid. 5. Transfers the swaddled newborn to the neonatal intensive care unit in an open bassinet. Correct answer. Preterm newborns are at high risk for cold stress due to immaturity of the thermoregulatory center in the brain, inadequate subcutaneous fat, and an inability to initiate shivering. These attributes make it difficult for the preterm newborn to maintain normal body temperature, axillary temperature of 97.7 to 99.5 F, covering the scale with warmed blankets protects against conductive heat loss which may occur when the newborn's skin comes into contact with a cooler surface, option 1. Skin-to-skin -skin contact with the parents for stable. Preterm newborns promotes thermoregulation through conduction of body heat to the newborn, option 2. Radiant warmers and incubators provide heat through convection and are routinely used to help newborns regulate their core temperatures. Providing care underneath the radiant warmer protects newborns from convection heat loss by reducing exposure to the cooler ambient environment and air drafts, option 3. Option 4. Drying the newborn completely of amniotic fluid immediately following birth protects the newborn from heat loss by evaporation and should occur prior to or simultaneously with other interventions. Option 5. The preterm newborn should be transferred from the birthing room to the intensive care unit via a pre-warmed incubator to prevent heat loss by convection. Educational Objective. Preterm newborns are at increased risk for cold stress and heat loss. 
The nurse can help prevent cold stress by covering cool surfaces with warm blankets, completely drying the newborn after birth. Providing care in the radiant warmer, transferring the newborn in a pre-warmed incubator, and encouraging skin-to-skin -skin contact. It is the first day on the job for the newly hired unlicensed assistive personnel, UAP. Which of these illustrate appropriate delegation instructions for the registered nurse, RN, to give the UAP? Select all that apply. 1. Elevate the right leg on two pillows. 2. Measure client for compression stockings. 3. Please let me know what the urine looks like. 4. Tell me what the client eats at lunch. 5. Verify wrist restraints are on correctly. Correct answer. Directions to the unlicensed assistive personnel. Up should be for tasks versus total client responsibility with specific and explicit requirements versus those requiring analysis, judgment, evaluation. The nursing process. Elevate leg on two pillows is very specific and does not require specialized knowledge or skill. Option 1. Report what the client eats at lunch is data collection only, option 4. The RN will analyze the data to see if the amount of food is adequate. Option 2, the UAP may apply compression stockings or devices. But the RN or LP should measure the client to choose the appropriate size as this is beyond the up scope of practice. Option 3, this involves an assessment that the RN should perform. The RN could ask for specific data, such as amount of urine or presence of blood clots. Option 5. This requires a judgment. Is the restraint tight enough, too tight and causing impaired circulation? That the RN should make. The UAP could be assigned a specific task, such as offering a drink to the client. Educational objective. Assign a new up specific tasks that do not require specialized knowledge or skills. The UAP can gather data but should not be asked to assess, analyze, evaluate, or measure client for compression devices. The emergency department nurse is obligated to make a report for which situations. Select all that apply. 1. To a client's employer that the client had a car crash while intoxicated. 2. To the authorities that an elderly client has suspicious bruising but denies caregiver abuse. 3. To the medical examiner of a death following trauma, even if the family refuses autopsy. 4. To the spouse of a client that the client has a reportable sexually transmitted disease. 5. To the supervisor that an oncoming healthcare provider has the smell of alcohol on the breath. Correct answer. There are several circumstances in which the nurse is legally required to report to appropriate civil authorities. Suspected elder abuse must be reported to the appropriate authorities for investigation. The nurse has a legal obligation to report signs of abuse regardless of client's ability or willingness to advocate for themselves, option 2. The nurse should report deaths that meet medical examiner reporting guidelines, like suspected to be the result of a crime, trauma, or suicide to the authorities for investigation. The local medical examiner has the legal authority and obligation to perform an autopsy independent of the family's wishes, option 3. For the sake of client safety, nurses should immediately report impaired or intoxicated healthcare workers, regardless of their position, option 5. Under the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, a client's reason for an emergency department visit cannot be communicated to employers without the client's permission, option 1. Health authorities must be notified of a reportable sexually transmitted disease regardless of client wishes. Depending on the condition, authorities may report findings to sexual contacts. But it is a violation of client privacy for the nurse to share this information with the client's family or spouse, option 4. Educational objective. The nurse is required to report an impaired co-worker, a suspicious death, and elder abuse to appropriate authorities.
The nurse is legally prohibited from sharing health information with employers or family members without the client's permission. If you like this content, please like, comment, and subscribe.